video will cover basic amplifier parameters and characteristics. You will see how the circuits are designed to establish the required operating voltage for common circuits like the small signal amplifiers, power amplifiers and operational amplifiers. When a semiconductor device is operated in a switching mode, it is being used as a digital device. When the devices are operated linearly, they are being used as analog circuits. The most commonly used analog circuit is the amplifier. The amplifier is represented by a triangular symbol which may be used to represent discrete component circuits or a multi-stage integrated circuit amplifier. There are many circuit configurations which exist between these two extremes. Amplifiers are used to reproduce small input signals. Amplifiers may be powered by batteries or electronic power supplies. The characteristics of all amplifiers may be described in terms of a few basic parameters. Gain, impedance, and distortion. The gain of a circuit is a measure of the increase in signal level from the input to the output. Gain may be measured in terms of current, voltage, or power. The unit of measurement for gain is the decibel. In general, gain equals the output divided by the input. When gain is expressed in decibels, the equations require the use of logarithms to the base 10. For voltage, the equation in gain in decibels equals 20 log 10 times voltage out divided by voltage in. For current, the equation is gain in decibels equals 20 log 10 times current out divided by current in. And for power, the equation is gain in decibel equals 10 log 10 times power out divided by power in. Because gain is only a ratio of two like quantities, it has no absolute unit of measurement. The decibel is the relative unit used, indicating the relative differences in the two electrical measurements. The amplifier's input and output impedance is another important circuit characteristic. The amplifier receives its input signal from a prior circuit called a stage and it delivers its output to a succeeding stage or a load device. The amplifier receiving the signal must not present too much of a load to the signal source, which may be another amplifier's output. If the load becomes too great, the signal source will be unable to provide enough signal power to drive the amplifier input and the amplifier's output will be pulled down to zero. The ideal amplifier will have an infinite input impedance, requiring no current from the signal source. The best power transfer and lowest distortion is achieved when the amplifier's output impedance equals the input impedance of the circuit being driven. The third parameter of the amplifier is called the distortion. As you recall, the amplifier is designed to increase the amplitude of the input signal by its gain factor. Since there are no perfect components or circuits, all amplifiers will distort the input signal. Distortion may occur in frequency, phase, or in the amplitude of the signal. Frequency distortion occurs when a certain range of frequencies are amplified by a different amount than others. This distortion is the result of the capacitance and inductance used throughout the circuit. The degree of frequency distortion in the amplifier is described by its frequency response specifications. The frequency response specifications indicate the relative output over a specific frequency range. Phase distortion, on the other hand, will occur when certain bands of frequencies require different amounts of time to pass through an amplifier. Even though the sine wave consists of a single frequency, other more complex waveforms are derived by mixing the sine wave with even or odd harmonic waves of the sine wave. For the amplifier to produce an exact reproduction of the input signal, it must not delay any part of the signal or the signal will become distorted. Amplitude distortion occurs when the output signal is not a faithful reproduction of the input signal or wave shape. This may be caused by the amplifier being driven into saturation and clipping the peaks of the signal. There are three other types of amplitude distortion, harmonic, intermodulation, and transient intermodulation. 
Harmonic distortion occurs when unwanted frequencies are added to the amplified signal. Harmonic distortion is impossible to completely eliminate in practical amplifying devices. This type of distortion is usually generated during the process of amplification. The total harmonic distortion will be given as a percentage of the output signal. Intermodulation distortion is a result of one sinusoidal component modulating another. This creates a new frequency which becomes a part of the output signal. Transient intermodulation distortion will occur when the input signal changes so rapidly that the amplifier cannot keep up. This usually results in distortion on the rise time part of the wave shape. As we have seen, the ability of an amplifier to deliver a signal must be matched to the requirements of the load being supplied. The circuit used to couple the power to the load will generally be a power amplifier. The power amplifier is usually fed by voltage amplifier stages. The voltage amplifier is used to boost the incoming signal to a level sufficient to drive the power output stage. Voltage and power amplifiers have significant differences from one another. Therefore, we will examine them separately. In order to amplify a signal, the device must be capable of producing a large increase in its output voltage and or current in response to a small change at its input. The signal at the input will control the device so that it produces a larger signal at the output. The earliest electronic amplifying device was the vacuum tube. The input signal is applied at the control grid, which is placed between the cathode and plate of the vacuum tube. The input signal controls the current flow between the cathode and plate. The large plate current is much larger than the current supplied by the input signal. Today, however, most general purpose amplifiers use semiconductor devices to provide amplification. The bipolar transistor and field effect transistor will perform the same function as the vacuum tube, but they do it much more efficiently. The semiconductor will use far less current for the same amount of amplification. Semiconductor devices used in power amplifiers differ from those used in voltage amplifiers both physically and electrically. This is because power amplifying devices are physically larger and are designed to operate with higher voltage and current levels than those required for the smaller signal amplifiers. Other than this, the basic concept of both types of amplifier circuits are quite similar. When working with amplifier circuits, the DC power supply must satisfy three requirements. It must supply sufficient energy to the amplifier stage. It is used to set the operating point of the device for proper operation. And it is used to set the electrical operating conditions of the amplifier. The DC circuit used to set the operating conditions of the amplifier is referred to as the bias circuit. The bias circuit should prevent changes in the operating conditions even if the amplifying device's characteristics change during normal circuit operations. A well-designed circuit will provide for a stable circuit operation. The load resistor, RL, which is attached to the output of the amplifier along with the power supply, is used to set the power output limitations of the amplifier. The output signal current cannot exceed the power supply voltage divided by the load resistor. This can be better illustrated using a simple transistor circuit. As you can see, the maximum current flow through the transistor is limited by the load resistor RL. When the current flow through the transistor is stopped, the voltage drop across the emitter collector of the transistor will equal the power supply voltage. Between the saturation and cutoff limitations of the transistor, there are an infinite number of current levels. Therefore, the current flowing in the output circuit at any instant must be between these two limits. Here we see a typical common emitter family of characteristic curves. At point A, we see that the transistor will conduct a little over 3 milliamps of current and develop a 10 volt drop across the collector emitter of the transistor with a 20 microamp bias current being applied at the base. By using Ohm's law, R equals E over I, 
we see that the transistor is developing a resistance of approximately 3,226 ohms. If the voltage drop across the transistor is held constant and the base current is increased to 50 microamps, we see that the collector current will increase. For this to happen, the transistor's emitter to collector resistance had to decrease when the base current was increased. By knowing the maximum collector current and the maximum collector emitter voltage drop, a DC load line can be drawn. The maximum collector current is developed when the transistor is at its saturation point, and the maximum collector emitter voltage drop occurs when the transistor is at its cutoff point. Typical amplifier operation will usually be somewhere along the DC load line between saturation and cutoff. When no input signal is applied, the amplifier's operating condition will be at a specific point on the DC load line called the quiescent operating point, or simply its Q point. The Q point is set by three parameters. First, the collector to emitter voltage, the collector current, and the base current. When the input signal is applied at the base, the base current will change, and this will result in the other two parameters changing along the DC load line. When the base current increases, the parameter will shift up the DC load line, and when the base current decreases, the other two parameters will shift down the DC load line. Small signal amplifiers are designed to increase the amplitude of the incoming signal. To allow for the widest variations in amplitude, the Q point should be located at the midpoint of the DC load line. This allows the signal to fluctuate the maximum amount between these two extremes. Here we see another graph representing a characteristic curve of an amplifier between cutoff and saturation. Notice that the quiescent operating point, or Q point, is located at the midpoint of the linear portion of the curve. If the input signal is not too great, the circuit will operate in a linear mode and negligible amplitude distortion will occur. This is the operating point of a Class A amplifier. Power amplifiers, on the other hand, are usually operated as Class B amplifiers and are biased at the cutoff point on the curve. This allows only the increase of base current to become amplified. Since part of the signal is amplified in the lower knee of the curve, it will produce some distortion. Generally, power amplifiers are operated in the push-pull configuration. This allows for proper amplification of both sides of the signal. Another type of power amplifier is the Class C amplifier. Class C amplifier is normally biased at two and one half times the cutoff point. Obviously, the Class C amplifier introduces significant amounts of amplitude distortion and is not used for audio reproduction. Notice that Q1 only produces pulses of current into the tank circuit. Since Q1 does not continuously conduct a steady flow of current, it cannot faithfully reproduce the incoming signal. Class C amplifiers are normally used in oscillator circuits. Another class of amplifier operation is the class AB1 and class AB2. As you recall, the class A amplifier was biased at the center of the linear portion of the characteristic curve, and this resulted in lower distortion. The class B amplifier, on the other hand, was biased at the cutoff point on the curve, which resulted in a more efficient circuit, but also some distortion. It is possible to bias two transistors in a push-pull configuration somewhere between the Class A and Class B bias points. These amplifiers are called AB amplifiers. The Class AB amplifier is less efficient than the Class B and more efficient than the Class A amplifier. At the same time, they have less distortion than Class B amplifiers and more distortion than Class A amplifiers. There are two types of AB amplifiers. AB1 and AB2. The Class AB1 amplifier is biased a little more negative than the Class A operating point. In the Class AB2 amplifier, its operating point is biased even further negative than is the AB1. Normally, the AB2 bias point will be at the top of the lower knee of the characteristic curve. Since the AB2 is biased more negative than the AB1 operation, it requires more driving power than the AB1 amplifier. Let's quickly review some of the material just discussed.
The characteristics of an amplifier may be described in terms of a few basic parameters, gain, impedance, and distortion. As you recall, the gain of a circuit is a measure of the increase in signal level from the input to the output. The input and output impedance of an amplifier must be matched to the connecting circuits if good power transfer and low distortion are desired. There are three basic types of distortion which may occur in an amplifier circuit. These are frequency distortion, phase distortion, and amplitude distortion. The DC power supply used for an amplifier circuit must satisfy three requirements. It must supply sufficient energy to the amplifier stage, it is used to set the operating point of the device, and it is used to set the electrical operating conditions of the amplifier circuit. A family of characteristic curves may be plotted for any amplifier. Once the family of curves has been plotted, a DC load line may be drawn. Typical amplifier operation will usually be somewhere along the DC load line between saturation and cutoff. When no input signal is applied to the amplifier, the amplifier's operating conditions will be at a specific point on the DC load line. This point is referred to as the quiescent operating point, or simply the Q point. The quiescent operating point is set by three parameters. One, the collector to emitter voltage, two, the collector current, and three, the base current. The Q point of a Class A amplifier will be located at the midpoint of the linear portion of the characteristic curve. The Q point of a Class B amplifier will be located at the cutoff point on the characteristic curve. And the Q point of a Class C amplifier will be located at approximately two and one half times the cutoff point. Class C amplifiers are never used for audio reproduction. This concludes our first review. As you learned earlier, the operating point of the amplifier is set by the bias circuitry. This will usually be a fixed current bias arrangement. The base bias current is determined by the VCC and the base bias resistor RB. The fixed bias circuit shown is quite simple, requiring a minimum number of components. However, in a practical circuit, the bias requirements of a circuit will change during normal circuit operation. As the ambient temperature changes, so will the biasing requirements of the transistor. This is due to the fact that as the temperature increases, the collector current through the transistor will also increase, so some other bias arrangement is generally preferred. The base bias arrangement shown here will provide some improvement over the previous fixed bias circuit. This circuit uses collector feedback bias to allow the base current to react to changes in collector current. As you notice, the base resistor is attached to the collector of the transistor and not to VCC. If the collector current increases for any reason, the collector voltage will decrease, which will cause the voltage being applied to the base of the transistor to decrease. This in turn will cause the transistor to conduct less current and stabilize the circuit. By using the collector feedback method, the base current can be controlled by the collector current of Q1. However, this does create a new problem. Since some of the circuit's AC output is fed back into the base of the amplifier during normal operation, it will reduce the gain of the amplifier. Even though the gain loss may be a disadvantage, the collector feedback bias is widely used because of its simplicity. Here we see a more commonly used bias circuit. The two resistors RB1 and RB2 form a voltage divider network which places a fixed voltage at the base of Q1. This voltage divider also places a fixed voltage drop across the emitter resistor RE, which in turn sets the emitter current at a constant level. Since most of the current which flows into the emitter will also flow through the collector, it ensures that the collector current will remain constant. The voltage drop developed across RB2 will equal the sum of the voltage drops across RE and the emitter base junction of Q1. The emitter base junction will normally have a 7 tenths volt drop 
Therefore, the voltage drop across RE will be 7 tenths volt less than that of RB2. Care must be taken when choosing the values of RB1 and RB2 to ensure that changes in the transistor's base current do not affect the DC bias at the base. The current flow through RB1 will be the sum of the base current and the input current and the current flow through RB2. Remember, as the circuit amplifies the input signal, the base current must change. The base current, therefore, must be small when compared to the voltage divider current in order to prevent changes in the voltage drop developed across RB2. This is accomplished by choosing RB1 and RB2 values so that the voltage divider current will approximately equal the collector current of the circuit's Q point. Since most small signal amplifiers have a current gain of 20 or more, the base current will be 1 20th or less than the collector current flowing through the transistor. Therefore, this small base current will have little effect on the base voltage. The stability produced by the voltage divider bias circuit makes it a very popular design for amplifier biasing. Usually, small signal amplifiers are used for the first several stages of an amplifier system. Therefore, coupling networks are used between the different stages to transmit the modulated signal from one stage to the next without upsetting the bias of the individual stages. One of the most common coupling devices is a simple series capacitor that has a reactance low enough to pass the signal without attenuation while blocking the DC bias levels between the stages. As you can see, the input capacitor C1 passes the signal to the base of the first stage. The signal is then amplified and passed through capacitor C2 into the next stage for further amplification. Since a capacitor will not pass a DC voltage, the bias voltage of one stage will have no effect on the stage it is supplying the signal to. Another common coupling method uses a transformer to electromagnetically couple the stage together. As you can see, the collector resistor of the first stage has been replaced with a transformer. Changes in the collector current are electromagnetically coupled to the secondary of the transformer. The transformer secondary is then connected to the input of the next amplifier stage. Again, the DC bias voltage of the first stage is isolated from the base voltage of the second stage. Both the transformer and capacitor coupling methods are used for amplifying AC signal voltages. When using the voltage divider bias circuit, the current will flow through both the emitter resistor RE and the load resistor RL. Even though the primary purpose of the emitter resistor is in its stabilizing effect in the bias circuit, it will develop some of the signal voltage across it, which in turn reduces the output voltage drop at the collector. This results in a decrease in the gain of the stages. Therefore, in small signal amplifiers, the emitter resistor RE will be bypassed with a large capacitor CE. Capacitor CE will provide a low impedance path for any AC signal current. This eliminates any reduction in gain caused by the emitter resistor. The ideal small signal amplifier should amplify all frequencies equally within the linear portion of the characteristic curve. But due to the biasing circuitry and coupling circuitry of the amplifier, this ideal situation cannot exist. As you recall, the reactance of a capacitor depends upon the frequency being applied to it. The reactance increases as the frequency decreases. Therefore, at low frequencies, the coupling capacitor may attenuate the incoming signal. If the reactance of the capacitor exceeds about one-tenth of the circuit's input resistance, the gain of the circuit will be reduced. The emitter bypass capacitor and the output coupling capacitor will also affect the gain of the circuit at low frequencies. This will result in a reduction of the output signal. At higher frequencies, the inner capacitance of the transistor will reduce the gain of the amplifier, again resulting in a reduction of the output signal. Here we see the frequency response curve of a typical amplifier. As you notice, the voltage gain is fairly constant for the middle portion of the response curve and the gain drops off appreciably at each end of the frequency response curve. When the gain falls to 0.707 of the response curve, the signal is said to be at the cutoff frequency point. 
There will be a cutoff point at the low frequency end and one at the high frequency end. The range of frequencies between these two cutoff points is called the passband frequency. At the cutoff points, only one half of the power is available. Therefore, sometimes you will hear the cutoff points being referred to as the half power points. The perfect amplifier should have an infinite input impedance with a zero output impedance. This would allow the stage to operate so there is no current drain from the previous stage and at the same time have an unlimited ability to drive the next stage. Unfortunately, most small signal amplifiers will use the common emitter configuration and it rates poorly in both of these parameters. The typical input impedance of the common emitter configuration will usually be around 3,000 to 4,000 ohms, while the output impedance will be fairly high, usually around 50,000 ohms. After the weak signal has been amplified sufficiently, it is fed into a power amplifier to develop the power necessary to drive the output load. Audio power amplifiers are biased Class B. As you recall, the Class B amplifier is biased at the cutoff point. Therefore, current will only flow through the Class B amplifier when it is driven into conduction by the incoming signal. Since current only flows in the Class B amplifier for half of every cycle, it generally requires the use of two transistors to amplify the incoming signal. Each transistor will amplify half of every cycle. We call this arrangement a push-pull amplifier. As you can see, when the current through one transistor increases, the current through the other transistor will decrease. The increasing magnetic field produced in one half of the output transformer is aided by the decreasing magnetic field produced in the other half of the transformer. This gives the effect of one transistor pushing while the other transistor is pulling. From this illustration, we see when the top of the secondary on T1 is positive with respect to the bottom of T1, the signal current will flow from the center tap winding into the junction of R3 and R4. At this point, Q1 is forward biased and Q2 is reverse biased. Therefore, the current will flow through R1 and into the emitter base junction of Q1. A small percentage of the current flowing into Q1 will flow through the base area and back to the top of the secondary of T1. The remainder of the current will flow through the collector of Q1 and into the top of the primary of T2. From here, the current will flow from the center tap back to B+. A small bias current will flow from the common through R4, then through R3, and into the positive side of the power supply. When the input signal reverses, and the top of the secondary of T1 becomes negative with respect to the bottom of T1, the current will flow from the center tap on the secondary of T1 into the junction of R3 and R4. At this point, Q1 is now reverse biased, and Q2 is forward biased. So the current now flows through R2 and into the emitter base junction of Q2. Some of the current will flow through the base and back to the bottom of the secondary of T1. The remaining current will flow through the collector of Q2 and into the bottom of the primary of transformer T2. From here, the current will flow to B+. Once again, a small bias current will flow from the common through R4, then through R3, and back to B+. As you saw earlier, distortion cannot be avoided in a Class B amplifier. Therefore, it is common practice to drive the amplifiers as hard as possible to obtain the maximum efficiency. Class B amplifiers are used where high efficiency and high output power is required and where a small amount of distortion can be tolerated. The typical efficiency of the Class B amplifier will be around 50 to 60%. So far, we have examined the Class A amplifier and the Class B amplifier. We have seen that the Class A amplifier was biased at the midpoint of the characteristic curve and that it operated with very little distortion. Since the Class A amplifier draws current even when no input signal is applied, it is a very inefficient circuit. The Class B amplifier, on the other hand, was biased at the cutoff point. Therefore, the Class B amplifier will have a small amount of distortion and is more efficient since it only draws current when it has an incoming signal. The 
The Class B amplifier is also generally operated in a push-pull operation, which requires the use of two transistors and a center tap transformer. The push-pull amplifier can also be biased as AB1 or AB2 amplifiers. This places the bias point between the Class A and Class B operating points. To obtain even higher efficiency, it is necessary to bias the transistor far beyond the cutoff point. Such an amplifier is called a Class C amplifier. By increasing the reverse bias of the transistor, it also increases the distortion of the output signal. The resulting output waveform will not even be half of the input waveform, but instead will be a series of pulses formed by the very top of the waveform. The current will flow through the transistor for a small percentage of the input cycle. Since the Class C amplifier cannot be used to reproduce the incoming signal because the distortion is too great, it is generally fed into a tank circuit, which is tuned to the input frequency. The flywheel effect of the tank circuit will restore the signal to a sine wave, which will operate at the resonant frequency of the tank circuit. Since the tank circuit is tuned to a certain band of frequencies, it will respond to a relatively narrow band of frequencies. The Class C amplifier is generally used to amplify the output of an oscillator circuit. The efficiency of the Class C amplifier will typically be 70 to 80 percent. We will now pause for a short review of the most recent material discussed. Class A amplifiers are generally used for the first few stages in many amplifying systems. This is due to the fact that Class A amplifiers will reproduce the incoming signal with very little distortion. Class A amplifiers are biased at the midpoint on the characteristic curve, so the amplifier can amplify the incoming signal by equal amounts along the linear portion of the curve. Capacitors and inductively coupled coils are used as coupling devices between amplifier stages so that the biasing arrangement of one circuit does not affect the circuit it is feeding. Class B amplifiers are generally used as the final stage in the amplifier system. Class B amplifiers are designed for power and will typically use two transistors in a push-pull configuration. Since the Class B amplifier is biased at the cutoff point on the characteristic curve, it will produce some distortion at the low frequency end. Class B amplifiers are used when high efficiency and high output power are required. It is common practice to drive the Class B amplifier as hard as possible to obtain maximum efficiency. Since the Class B amplifier only draws current when there is an incoming signal, it has a typical efficiency of approximately 60 percent. To obtain an even higher efficiency amplifier stage, it is necessary to bias the transistor far beyond the cutoff point. Such an amplifier is called a Class C amplifier. Increasing the bias point beyond the cutoff does create significant problems for audio or video reproduction. The signal will no longer be a faithful reproduction of the input but rather it will merely be a series of pulses. Since the Class C amplifier cannot be used to reproduce audio or video information, it will generally feed a tank circuit which is used to restore pulses back into a sine wave, the frequency of which will be that of an incoming signal. Class C amplifiers are generally used to amplify the weak signals produced by an oscillator circuit. The efficiency of the Class C amplifier will typically be about 80 percent. This concludes review number two. Most amplifiers used in today's modern equipment are contained in a single package called an integrated circuit. These amplifiers are usually a multi-stage type with a non-inverting and inverting input. The input marked with the plus is called the non-inverting input, and the input marked with the minus is called the inverting input. One of the most common IC amplifiers is the operational amplifier, or op-amp for short. 
Today's operational amplifier is so inexpensive that millions are used in circuits throughout the world. Their low cost, versatility, and dependability have expanded their use far beyond those envisioned by the early designers. Many of the present day uses of the op amp are in the fields of process control, communications, computers, servo systems, power and signal sources, displays, and testing or measuring systems. Basically, the op amp is a very good high gain DC amplifier. The operational amplifier has five terminals. Two are used by the power source, two are used for input signals, and one terminal is used as the output. Internally, the op amp is a complex maze of transistors, diodes, and resistors. It is not necessary to know anything about the internal operation of the op amp in order to use it, but there is much to learn about how to connect the external components to the op amp since these determine what the circuit will do. Some operational amplifiers may be operated from a single power source, while other types require a split supply. Those requiring a split supply must have a positive power source and a negative power source. Since there is only one output terminal on the op amp, it is called a single ended output. There is a limit to the current that can be drawn from the output terminal of the op amp, usually around 10 milliamps. There is also a limit on the output terminal's voltage levels. These limits are set by the supply voltages and by the internal output transistors contained in the IC package. These transistors require about 1 to 2 volts from the collector to emitter to ensure that they are acting as amplifiers and not as a switch. Therefore, the output terminal can rise to within 2 volts of the plus power supply and drop to within 2 volts of the negative power supply. The upper limit is called the positive saturation voltage and the lower limit is called the negative saturation voltage. Some operational amplifiers, like the 741 for instance, have internal circuitry that automatically limits the current drawn from the output terminal. Even with a short circuit, the output current will be limited to about 25 milliamps. As we mentioned earlier, there are two input terminals labeled plus and minus. These are referred to as differential input terminals because the output voltage depends on the difference between the two and the gain of the amplifier. As you see in this illustration, when the non-inverting input is made positive with respect to the inverting input, the output will be positive with respect to the ground. And when the non-inverting input is made negative with respect to the inverting input, the output will be negative with respect to ground. The polarity at the output terminal will be the same as the polarity at the non-inverting input terminal. Therefore, the plus is called the non-inverting input and the minus is called the inverting input, since the output signal is opposite of that being applied to the inverting input terminal. With no feedback between the output terminal to the input terminal, the open loop gain of the 741 op amp will be about 200,000. With the open loop gain being so high for the op amp, the input voltages could only swing plus or minus 55 microvolts if the op amp is operated from a plus and minus 13 volt power source. Therefore, the op amp usually has some sort of feedback to reduce the gain of the circuit to allow for a larger variation in the input signal. When operated with no feedback, the op amp is being operated as a comparator circuit. In a comparator application, the op amp does not operate as an amplifier, but rather as a switching device used to indicate when a voltage level is above, below, or equal to a known reference voltage. Here we see an op amp being used as a voltage level indicator with two light emitting diodes at the output. This circuit can be used to indicate the charge level of a battery on a battery charger. When the voltage at the non-inverting input is below the reference voltage being applied at the inverting input, the output voltage will be negative and LED1 will be lit. As the voltage from the battery increases to a level that is greater than the reference voltage, then the output voltage will swing positive and LED1 will turn off and LED2 will turn on. This would indicate that the battery was fully charged. One of the most important applications of the operational amplifier 
is in its ability to deliver an undistorted larger version of the input signal. When used as an amplifier, an external feedback resistor will be connected between the output terminal and the inverting input terminal of the op amp. This resistor will provide a negative feedback from the output into the input of the device. As we shall see, there are many advantages obtained with negative feedback. One advantage is that the circuit performance will no longer depend on the open loop gain of the op amp, because by adding the feedback resistor, a loop was formed from the output to the input. The gain of the circuit will now depend largely on the feedback resistor. For best results, 1% resistors should be used for the feedback device. Here we see a widely used op amp circuit. The closed loop gain of this circuit is set by R1 and R2. R2 is the feedback resistor. A positive signal is also being applied to the inverting input. Since the input signal is positive, the output of the amplifier will go negative and produce an amplified reproduction of the input signal. When the input signal crosses the zero reference line and goes negative, it causes the output voltage of the amplifier to swing positive and produce a positive reproduction of the input signal. As you notice, the output waveform is 180 degrees out of phase with the input signal being applied at the inverting input. Also, the gain of this circuit is 10, since the output signal is 10 times larger than the input signal. Here we see a source follower circuit. This circuit is also called a buffer amplifier or isolation amplifier. The input voltage is applied directly into the non-inverting input of the op amp. As you notice, the output voltage will equal the input voltage in both magnitude and phase. In a manner of speaking, the output voltage follows the input voltage source. The non-inverting input of the op amp will have a very high input impedance, somewhere in the order of several megohms. Therefore, the input and output voltages are basically isolated from one another. The output impedance of the voltage follower will usually be very low. The voltage follower is frequently used as a buffer amplifier to reduce voltage errors caused by source loading and to isolate high impedance sources from the next stage. Source followers are also subject to latch up. This occurs if the input voltage limit is exceeded. When the input voltage limit at the non-inverting input is exceeded, the input transistor in the op amp will saturate. When the non-inverting input transistor saturates, it causes the inverting input to act like the non-inverting input, which causes a positive feedback that will hold the IC in saturation. As you have already seen, the operational amplifier may also be used as a comparator. The comparator circuit will compare an input signal voltage on one input with a fixed reference voltage on the other input. The voltage of the comparator circuit will be a negative or positive saturation voltage, depending on which input is greater. Op amps as comparators are also used in Schmidt trigger circuits to clean up square wave pulses. They are also used as zero crossing detector circuits. This circuit will indicate in which direction the input signal crosses the zero volt reference line. The op amp as a comparator can also be used as a voltage level detector to indicate when the input voltage reaches a given reference voltage. And the comparator can also be used to generate triangular or square wave pulses. Even though the general purpose op amp can be used as a comparator, there are circuits designed specifically for this purpose. The LM119 is such a device. Here we see a simple zero crossing detector using the 301 operational amplifier as a comparator. The input signal is a triangular voltage which is being applied across the inverting input. The non-inverting input is connected to ground. The output of this circuit is a square wave pulse that operates between the positive voltage saturation and the negative voltage saturation points. As the triangular input signal crosses the zero volt reference line and goes positive, it causes the output to saturate at the negative saturation point. When the triangular input signal decreases back to the zero reference line again and goes negative, it causes the output to saturate at the positive saturation point. In a practical comparator circuit, as the input signal approaches the zero reference line, 
The internal noise in the op amp will cause the circuit to false trigger. This can be eliminated by the use of positive feedback. Positive feedback can be achieved by taking part of the output voltage and feeding it back to the non-inverting input of the device. This will create a variable reference voltage at the non-inverting input because the feedback voltage will depend on the voltage at the output. Resistors R1 and R2 form a voltage divider network at the output of the device. The feedback voltage is taken from the junction of these two resistors. When the output voltage is at the positive saturation point, the feedback signal is referred to as the upper threshold voltage. This occurs when the voltage at the non-inverting input is greater than the voltage at the inverting input. When the voltage at the inverting input becomes slightly more positive than the feedback voltage, then the output voltage will begin to decrease in amplitude. By using positive feedback, the output voltage will drop even faster and it will quickly drive the output into the negative saturation region. This results in a more stable switching action when the output switches polarity. When the output is at its negative saturation point, the feedback signal is called the lower threshold voltage. The device will stay in the negative saturation region as long as the inverting signal is more positive than the feedback signal. When the inverting signal becomes less positive than the feedback signal, then the output voltage will begin to swing in the positive direction. As the output voltage begins to increase in the positive direction, the positive feedback being fed into the non-inverting input will cause the device to snap into the positive saturation point. As you can see, the positive feedback causes the output voltage to snap from one saturation point to the other at a faster rate. This is due to the regenerative action of the positive feedback signal. Thus, the positive feedback eliminates false output transitions. The performance of a comparator circuit can be judged by the amount of time it takes for the device to switch from one saturation point to the other. This time is referred to as the hysteresis of the circuit and the voltage between these two switching points is called the hysteresis voltage. Even though the positive feedback made the operational amplifier's output switch at a faster rate from one saturation point to the other, the transition time is much too slow for many applications. It can typically be several microseconds. For faster switching times, special op amps are designed specifically for fast comparator applications. The LM710 and the LM311 are two such op amps. The LM710 has a switching time of only 40 nanoseconds, and the LM311 has a switching time of approximately 200 nanoseconds. Here we see two precision operational amplifiers. They are the LT1013 and the LT1014. The characteristics of the LT1013 and the LT1014 make them especially useful in such applications as instrumentation amplifiers or any other situation where the op amp must closely adhere to critical performance standards. These op amps can be operated from a single 5 volt DC power supply or from a dual polarity power supply with voltages up to plus and minus 22 volts. Their drift voltage is less than 2 microvolts per degree centigrade with an offset voltage of less than 150 microvolts. The open loop gain of the LT1013 and LT1014 are in excess of 8 million with a slew rate of 0.4 microseconds. Each amplifier section will only use 350 microamps of current and can source or sink up to 20 milliamps of load current. The relatively high current consumed by the bipolar integrated circuit amplifier has long been a drawback to their use in battery powered circuits. Thanks to CMOS technology, a new generation of micro power linear ICs have overcome this problem. Most CMOS linear ICs can be powered by a single polarity power supply with voltages ranging from 2 to 3 volts. Some devices can be powered by a 1 volt power source. The CMOS operational amplifier has an extremely high input impedance. It also has a unity gain bandwidth that exceeds 1 MHz, as well as a very high gain factor. As you can see, the CMOS op amp has a lot of potential. Even though the CMOS operational amplifier consumes very little power, it is important that you realize that some circuits which are designed with the CMOS device 
can consume nearly as much power as those designed with their bipolar counterparts. This situation occurs when the device is required to drive light-emitting diodes, loudspeakers, relays, or any other device which consumes large amounts of power. When using a CMOS device to drive an LED, it is recommended that you use a high brightness LED because they will emit a visible red light when the forward current is only one milliamp or less. Linear CMOS integrated circuits have the same vulnerabilities as other CMOS devices. The most common problem is electrostatic discharge. Even though many CMOS ICs contain protection circuits that reduce the possibility of electrostatic discharge, these devices should be handled in accordance with standard CMOS handling procedures. Also, unused input pins must be terminated at ground or one of the supply voltages. Unused pins that are left floating may pick up stray signals which cause unwanted oscillations that will greatly increase the chip's power consumption. As we have seen, the operational amplifier is a linear device and the output of the op amp is directly proportional to its input. The op amp has two inputs. One is the inverting input, which is designated with the minus sign, and the other is the non-inverting input, which is designated with the plus sign. The polarity of the signal being applied at the inverting input is reversed at the output of the device. In the same respect, the polarity of the signal being applied at the non-inverting input will remain unchanged at the op amp's output. The amplification factor or gain of the operational amplifier is controlled by the feedback resistor connected between the amplifier's output and the inverting input. We have also seen that the comparator is a linear circuit which has a digital output. Even though the comparator closely resembles the operational amplifier, it is designed to give an output that is either high or low, but never linear with respect to the input. Oftentimes, an operational amplifier with no feedback resistor will function as an acceptable comparator circuit. This part of the video will deal with troubleshooting the operational amplifier since most modern equipment will contain various types of operational amplifier ICs. A total failure of a well-designed op amp is rare because input overloads never saturate the circuit. The most common problems associated with the op amp are hum, drift, and noise. The most common cause of hum is the DC power supply which provides the power to the op amp. Another common cause is current leakage from other components on the circuit board. If hum or ripple is found at the operational amplifier output, short the input terminals and check for power supply ripple. Drift and noise are the most common sources of trouble. Even though there are several causes for this type of trouble, the power supply is still the most likely cause. This is due to the fact that operational amplifiers are extremely sensitive to an unstable power supply. When working with op amp circuits, the power supply should not drift more than plus or minus one millivolt on a typical power supply voltage of 15 volts. Another source of noise in the op amp is the null circuit. The null circuit is also called the zero correction circuit. This circuit takes voltage from both the positive and negative power supplies and inputs a small DC current to compensate for the internally generated offset. Because of the operational amplifier's extremely high open loop gain, they can be difficult to troubleshoot. If the op amp circuit uses a feedback capacitor, you can track down hum, drift, and noise by replacing the feedback capacitor with a resistor which has a value of at least 10 times greater than the input resistor. The op amp's output can be checked with a high gain scope to monitor the waveform. Another test that can be performed while the feedback resistor is in place is to check the null offset circuit in the IC. Short the amplifier's input terminals and vary the null adjustment while monitoring the op amp's output with the oscilloscope. As you change the offset adjustment, there should be a corresponding change in the output voltage. If the amplifier does not change the same in both the positive and negative direction, then saturation is taking place in the IC and the op amp should be replaced.
We have covered a great deal of information about amplifiers. To achieve the most from this video, it is recommended that you review it as many times as necessary to gain a thorough understanding of the principles shown to you. The future is bright for the technician who has a thorough understanding of the basics of electronic principles and theory.